So today we're looking at acid-base titrations and the calculations that go along with that. You're already familiar with what an acid-base titration is. We did that back in chapter four with the lab. Um, but we didn't do all the types of calculations that you can do off of it at that time. Um, and that will take us the whole period to get through that. Then uh, tomorrow we'll deal with acid-base indicators, which is a shorter topic, and we'll have a little time to spare after that. And then, of course, on Wednesday, we're going to wrap up Chapter 15 and uh, test on that so that we don't have to carry that into winter break with us. Speaking of carrying things into winter break, then maybe tomorrow I'll give you the Chapter 16. It's two or three sections. It's not that much. There's some extra credit associated with Chapter 16, so make it worth your while. And right about now is a good time to get some extra credit, I think. It's, you know, this is really a gift for me to you for the holidays, if you think about it. And uh, the posters. <laughs> and the posters. Um, so uh, let's get going on this because there's, there's quite a bit to it. If I can find where I put my notes. I give you the Henderson Hausbach equation. Yes. College board might not give it to you, probably won't, but I'll give it to you. Actually makes it easier for me to grade, just a lot less writing than the right answer. I'd rather go with that route. Um, let's start with this. A titration is commonly used to determine the amount of acid or base in a solution. This process involves a solution of known concentration, known as the titrant, delivered from a burette into an unknown solution until the substance being analyzed is just consumed. For example, a known volume and concentration of a base may be used to determine the concentration of a sample of acid. In an acid-base titration, the equivalence point is the moment in the reaction when the unknown sample has just been completely consumed by the titrate. Ideally, the equivalence point is signaled by the color change of an indicator, and we will look at indicators and how to select them more tomorrow. The progress of an acid-base titration is often monitored by plotting the pH of the solution being analyzed as a function of the amount of titrant added. And I'll show you a graph of that on the next page or two that follows. Such a plot is called a pH curve or a titration curve. We didn't do, um, when we did our titrations, we didn't make a pH curve or a titration curve because doing it with the tools that we have, it would be extremely tedious to stop and measure the pH each time. Uh, we just counted on an indicator to tell us where the equivalence point was because that's all we cared about. But you could put in a pH meter into your solution and monitor the uh, change in pH with, with each additional drop of the titrant and uh, graph that and plot that and get a titration curve. So uh, the graphs that we'll be looking at are if you electronically recorded the pH over time or over volume. Some important points regarding acid-base reactions. First, the pH at the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base, is going to be 7. Truly neutral only when a strong acid is titrated with a strong base. Also note that the soap produced in a strong acid, strong base reaction is a salt. So the, the acid cancels out the base and you get a neutral salt, which doesn't affect the pH. So basically you're left at a pH of seven. An example of something like that is pretty easy to calculate. Strong acids and strong bases are pretty easy to deal with. If we were to calculate the molarity of a 
0.01 liter solution of hydrochloric acid solution needed to neutralize a 0.02 liter sample of a one molar sodium hydroxide solution at the equivalence point where the HCl just consumes the sodium hydroxide. We use what we know about known would be the sodium hydroxide and we can use that to analyze what's going on with the hydrochloric acid. Calculations are really uh, chapter four types of calculations. There's no equilibrium with this part of the problem. You take the volume of the sodium hydroxide. Say for every liter of sodium hydroxide. Every one mole of sodium hydroxide reacts with one mole of uh, hydrochloric acid. So you would uh, react with 0 0.020 moles of HCl here. The only clumsy part about this is when you combine the two solutions, you would have a new volume. Well, actually, you don't have to do that for this one. We're not actually caring about the volume of the uh, other stuff. We're just killing. Don't listen to me. Um, we were just trying to figure out this information. So if that's how many moles of HCl we have, we take 0 0.020 moles of the HCl. And that would give us a two molar solution there. We just wanted to know the concentration of the original solution of hydrochloric acid that we we're titrating to analyze its molarity. Um, so the idea is use a known molarity and volume of a titrant to analyze something about your unknown sample. Key thing to remember here, strong acid plus the ton base. Makes for a neutral solution. When the acid consumes the base in equal proportions. All you're left with is water and a neutral salt, and that's why we're going to be at a pH of seven. But that would be too easy because there's no equilibrium in that. We got to make it into an equilibrium problem. Oh, and this is just. Uh, We love Henderson Hasselbach. What if we didn't have a strong acid with a strong base? How would that change the pH at our equivalence point? If the substance being titrated is a weak acid or base, then the pH at the equivalence point will not be seven. If it's a weak acid, with a strong base, pH that is greater than seven. Due to the fact that the conjugate base of the weak acid is going to influence the pH of the solution. More specifically, if you have a weak acid with a strong base, the salt that you get is going to be a So an acid and a base mix salt and water, but if your salt is basic at the equivalence point, you're not going to be at a pH of seven. You're going to be a basic pH. So to give you an example, and we're doing just a partial solution here with this example. Um, let's say we had a titration with the weak acid. Acetic acid, sodium hydroxide. And we got equal moles and volumes. We would say these are, um, I have to write this in here. 
these are um, just means all of them are the same. In this example. And uh, also keep in mind that this is a basic salt. Um, the first thing that we have to do in an acid base titration, and this is usually the case, is we'd have to do some stoichiometry to this. So right here, let me do the stoichiometry problem. So there's going to be some stoichiometry involved. So if I got um, 100 milliliters, which is 0.1 liters of a one molar solution. What I would want to do for the stoichiometry is figure out how many moles of the gas that I have. So 0.1 liter times one gives me 0.1 mole. I got the same volume and the same molarity of the base, so that's also 0.10 mole. And initially, before the reaction happens, I wouldn't have any of the salt. So I just have the reactants. I have that many moles of that reacting with that many moles of that. Because the acid reacts with the base and there's equal moles of each, this will get completely consumed. This will get completely consumed. And because they're all one to one to one mole ratios, this will be produced in the same number of moles. So, Zero moles of this, zero moles of this, and point zero moles of that basic salt being produced. One other little important note, and this is very typical with acid base reactions, always watch out for this. You have a new volume. We had 100 milliliters combined with 100 milliliters, so we have. 200 volume. And that will impact the molarity of our sodium acetate. So at the equivalence point where the acid has consumed the base, now we're just left with some kind of salt in water. It just happens to be a basic salt. And that basic salt is going to equilibrate with the water and in influence our pH. So this part is going to be the equilibrium of the problem. You don't have to worry about the equilibrium of the problem when you got a strong acid with strong base, but if one of them is weak, then you do. So taking the amount of sodium acetate we have here, I'm going to have 0.10 moles of sodium acetate, dividing it by the volume, which was now 0.200, the molarity that I have for the uh, acetate ion from the sodium acetate is going to be 0.5 molar. And because it's a basic salt, it's going to receive the anion is going to receive a hydrogen. That's what bases do. It's going to produce hydroxide because that's what bases do. And uh, this would be a KB value. Initially, before equilibrium, we've had zero. This is going to go down by X. It's going to go up by X. And then the rest of it would just be a, an equilibrium solution. Um, because this is a basic salt, we'd set up KB. We've got the weak acid 
and the hydroxide over the acetate ion. And from there, and I'm not going to calculate it, I'm just going to the concentration of hydroxide by dissolving for X. We find the pOH because once we got that, we just take the negative log of the OH to get the pOH. And we would find from that the pH as a 14. So that's as far as we're going to take the calculations, but let's just get to that point that takes some organization. With the values you can, I mean, you have, you can solve for We could. I just don't feel like. That's, that's all I wanted to do with that one. Just get you to the point where you could solve it by plugging in the numbers. And of course, a short code would work for this one, so it'd be all good. Do you have the value for uh, It's acetic acid, so if we, we weren't given it here, but you would be given it. You'd be either given the Ka for acetic acid, or you'd be given the Kb for the acetate ion. More likely, you'd get the acetic acid, and then you would have to calculate the Kb from that. Can you use the Hasselbalch equation if you have the Ka? Um, the thing about this, is at this point the Henderson Hasselbach wouldn't work that well because you don't have you need concentrations of both parts so it's only when you have more of a buffer system set up where you do have some acetate and you have some acetic acid and we'll definitely use that later in some problems but if you only have one of the two components then you have to kind of do it the the other way, the lengthier way. Is there a Henderson Hasselbalch equation for KV? Yes, we'll use that at the end today. We'll do one of those. It's uh, basically the same setup. Your ass and your base get flipped upside down, and of course, you use a PKA, PKB instead of a PKA. Um, let's look at another scenario. We'll do about the same amount of work with this one. If you had a weak base, up with a pH that's less than seven. At the equivalence point, this time because of the conjugate acid of the weak base that's left over, because the salt we produce with a strong acid and a weak base is going to be an acidic salt. This time it's an acidic salt. So let's say we're doing our titration, and again, we're going to have equimolar, equal molarity, and moles of ammonia and HCl. When ammonia reacts with HCl, this is acting like the acid. As a donor, base is a receiver, so we get some ammonium, and then uh, we'll make the ammonium ion that way, and we'd have ammonium chloride. We could even make that a net ionic equation, just get rid of the chlorines on both sides, but we'll leave it like this for now. So, in this problem, um, first the stoichiometry. And the equilibrium again. We would take the moles of this, the moles of this, and in equilibrium, the acid would completely have consumed the base, so this would go down to nothing. One to one mole ratio, so this would go up by that amount. Very similar to the previous problem, 
we actually again have a, a new volume. And that will uh, influence our molarity of the ammonium. So I'm going to bring down the ammonium chloride and more specifically just the ammonia, ammonium, because chlorine is the ion. This is a soluble salt and chlorine's from the strong acid and the strong acid doesn't impact anything because it can't uh, hydrolyze or react with the water to change anything. So we just have to pay attention to the ammonium which will have a concentration of 0 0.10 moles per hundred liters. Molar. And we don't have any of this to begin with this. This again will go down by a factor and because this is acting like an acidic salt, donating the hydrogen to the water in the process, we would need a Ka for this one. So we'd set up our equilibrium expression. I got a little room on the bottom, so we'll put it down here. We have the ammonia. We find the value for the concentration of and with that one assuming that we had the K, the Ka to work with, or perhaps we would have the Kb for ammonia, and from the Kb of ammonia, we could figure out the Ka of ammonium, and we finish it up that way. So the first thing that you should be picking up on this is that when you have an acid-base titration, you're gonna make some kind of salt in water. Only strong acids and bases make neutral salts, and that's easy because the pH is seven. There's no equilibrium involved. If one's weak and the other's strong, then you got to figure out if you're making a strong acid, uh, acidic salt or a basic salt, and that's going to involve the stoichiometry and the equilibrium. Let's take a look at a titration curve because that's one of the things in the title of this. A titration curve is a plot of the volume of the titrant of the solution that you're mixing together. Um, this is a strong acid, strong base titration, which are the easiest ones to read. You'll notice that as it becomes closer and closer to being equal, the equivalence point is kind of this straight line part the center of that curve. And for any strong acid, strong base, that should come out to be a pH of seven. I suppose there's a technicality there. It is measured at 25 degrees Celsius. But it's usually assumed that it is, which is pretty close to room temperature. Um, here's an example of what we're looking at. In this particular case, we're going to do a strong acid, strong base, which is the easier thing. We're considering the titration between 50 milliliters of the strong acid, nitric acid, that is 0.200 molar, with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. We want to observe what happens to the pH as the titrant is slowly added to the nitric acid solution. So in your flask, in your Erlenmeyer flask, you've got the sodium, uh, that the uh, 
sodium hydroxide. We are told that we have 50 milliliters of the nitric acid that we're titrating, and we're going to be adding to it some volume of sodium hydroxide. And just a little note about this titration, all the titrations that we're doing today, at any volume, and stop and calculate. couple familiar spots that they like to stop in a titration. Sometimes they like to, you know, first get with that original concentration of the acid is in this case. Sometimes they like to stop halfway in the titration and figure out what the pH is at that point. Equivalence point is usually a, a stopping point as well for the calculations. Occasionally they'll stop and take a point somewhere after the equivalence point as well if they're just trying to be uh, annoying. So the first spot that we want to do a calculation with, with this strong acid, strong base titration. And by the way, this is a neutral salt. First uh, calculation that we want to do is the pH before the titration even begins. So when we just have the acid by itself, what is the pH? red of the, uh, the molarity of the acid solution itself, which is 0.200. So that's pretty straightforward when you're working with a strong acid or a strong base. It's easy to calculate the pH by itself if you know the molarity. The pH as sodium hydroxide is added to the nitric acid before the equivalence point, we will see that the moles of hydrogen are gradually being consumed. So now we're talking about taking off here as we go up to this point before the equivalence point. Initially, the moles of hydrogen are uh, gradually being consumed by that base that we're adding, and the total volume of the solution is increasing. So we're consuming hydrogen, we're increasing the volume, and therefore the concentration of hydrogen is going to be decreasing, and the pH is going to be increasing. And that makes sense. You know, we're at our most hydrogen, and each drop of sodium hydroxide uses up some of that hydrogen, turns it into water and salt, and uh, as we add a base to it, of course, the pH is going to increase. The pH at the equivalence point, when the concentration of hydroxide is equal to the concentration of hydronium, and the only products are the neutral salt and water, therefore, the pH is the log beta of 1 times 10 to 87, which is the pH. Seven. For any strong acid, strong base titration at the equivalence point. The pH of the equivalence point for any acid base titration is taken as the midpoint of the vertical portion of the pH versus volume titration curve. That's what I was pointing out up here. We kind of look to see where the curve begins or starts to straighten out and where it kind of ends and then take a straight line and we take the if you're just looking at the graph. Then uh, the pH after the equivalence point, after we get to this spot right here, about that. O3 has been consumed 
the next graph will make the solution basic. These will go up pretty quickly from there because you just want and you see that line continues to go steeply upward. Important is that you should be able to calculate the pH of the solution and or the concentration of the species in the solution at any given point on the titration curve. And we'll see how that works with all these examples going forward. One little contrasting thing here. Um, the graph at the top of the page is when you're starting with an acid and you're titrating it with a strong base. It's possible that you could reverse this scenario. You could be titrating a solution that's a base and adding an acid to it. If that was the case, you would have the same type of graph. It would just be in the opposite direction. But still, it's that vertical portion center of that vertical proportion pH at the equivalence point with for a strong acid strong base titration. That's less common. I don't just based on the examples that you see in the textbook at least. This is more common <coughs> to add the base to the acid, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it in the reverse. I don't know why one's more common than the other. Just maybe our author's preference. But again, it would be pretty straightforward if it was just strong acids and strong bases. When you have uh, weak acids and bases involved, that's where the thinking comes in because that's where equilibrium comes in. But now that we're kind of familiar with what a curve would look like, a titration curve would look like, let's do it with a weak acid and a strong base titration. And this particular page, let's just say it gets a little dense on the uh, on the writing. Took me four colors to fit it all in there. I don't, I don't know how you guys are going to do it. The beak's not even here. He's not going to do it. Just, I didn't even notice he left. Really? working on his basketball exercise. Get ready for the big game. <clears throat> All right. Um, weak acid, strong base titration. Consider the pH curve for the titration of 50 milliliters of a 0.1 molar acetic acid solution, given a Ka value for that, with a gradual addition of the strong base sodium hydroxide, which also happens to be 0.1 molar. It just makes the numbers faster and easier to work with. Um, I've got the molecular equation here, but I put it into the net, net ionic equation because that's what the college board likes to work off of. Same thing, it's just, let's work off the net ionic equation. We took out the spectator ion of sodium and uh, we're working from what's left over here. The first thing I wanna do is figure out the pH just, and that's a little bit more difficult because we're starting out with a weak acid and we can't just assume it, it doesn't uh, ionize 100%. So we got to do a little equilibrium thing for that. We just take the acetic acid, HC2, HC2, H3O2, and we have it ionized. And put in this direction would be a Ka value. And 
and we have 0.100 molar solution of that because that's what we're told here. It's not the titration part yet. Go down by X, this will go up by X. The KA for that. be x squared minus x. Get rid of the minus x. So that x comes out to be 0 0.00134 molar, which gives us a concentration of the hydrogen ion. So we can say that, squeeze it in here, the pH is the negative log .87. That's about right there. It's actually 2.87. Before titrating. Just more work because it's a weak acid that we're beginning with and not a strong acid. The next point that we're being asked to calculate, and we're actually going to be calculating three different points on this page, which is why it's so crowded. The next page that we're going to calculate is the equivalence point where the acetic acid has just been completely consumed by the sodium hydroxide. And that's going to be a little bit harder to read off the graph. Because one of the things when you start doing a weak with a strong, this vertical, if that makes sense, it's got a little bit more of a slope to it. And figuring out like where the middle of that is, is just clumsier. Like what's the straightest part, the straightest line that we have in there before it curves? That seems kind of to be the straightest part, maybe a little bit more. And then we're supposed to take the middle of that, figure out. We're going to calculate it. But it's the same principle. Try to find that most vertical part and take the middle of that. The pH at the equivalence point, where the acid has just consumed the base, is going to have a spike part. The equilibrium part. Stoichiometry part is going to look something like this. Um, three, four, two. Yeah, so it's NaOH, NaC2H3O2, acid and base, like some kind of salt and water. I need to know how many moles of each that I have. I'm not going to show the work for it up there because it just clutters things up and most of the time you can do this as a little side thing, but if I have 50 milliliters and it's 0.100 moles per liter, and I remember to convert it into First, then we come up with zero moles. So that's where I'm getting the number from that I'm dropping right here. How many moles of acetic acid I have? And I have the same molarity of sodium hydroxide. And I need the same number of moles of sodium hydroxide to react with all that. So I'm going to take 100 milliliters of the uh, sodium hydroxide at the equivalence point, because that will produce the same number of moles of base. I need the same moles of acid and base to reach that equivalence point. Initially, I don't have any of this. 
I want enough base to react with all the acid, so this will get completely. And this will get completely consumed. This. So of course we get zero moles, zero moles. Also have a little problem because we combine two solutions, the acid and base solution, we've got a new volume. Is that reminder over here? We had um, 50 milliliters of this at that concentration, we must have used an equivalence point, 50 milliliters of this as well. 50 mil plus 50 mil. I'm going to put this over 0.100 liter. So I get the new molarity of my basic salt. Now that I know the concentration of the basic salt that's produced, which is the 0 0.005 over 0.1, I can start to do the equilibrium for the basic salt. I'll bring down the equation, I'll bring down the formula of the basic salt, but I'm gonna get rid of the sodium because the sodium is just a spectator ion. It comes from a strong base. It's not gonna influence the pH of my, my solution. So I'm just gonna bring down the C2H3O2, negative one, the acetate ion, which is the conjugate base of the strong acid or of the weak acid environment. It's going to act like a base. And uh, just keep in mind if it's a basic salt, and you got to be good at recognizing acidic salts and basic salts, but if it's a basic salt, that means. It's got to receive a hydrogen from water. Water loses uh, hydrogen, it becomes hydroxide. Um, conjugate base and the weak acid that it came from on the other side. Also, because it's acting like a base, this has a KB value associated with it. Because we're producing a hydroxide, it must be a KB value. So then I'm going to do the equilibrium part of this reaction. I've got 0 0.0050 divided by 0 0.1, so my new molarity is actually going to be 0 0.050 molar. Just be careful with that number because it's not two zeros, it's one zero in front of the five. Um, that's what I start with. I don't have any of this. I don't have any of this. This will go down my X. This will go up my X. I'm going to need a KB value for this, but I've got the KA written. Now I can figure out the KB. Acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So the KB will be the KW divided by the KA, 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. As we work with this one a lot. You know, space to squeeze things in here. So I'm going to do this. Five point six times ten to the ten. 
would be x squared over 0 0.050 minus x, but we're going to shortcut that. X comes out to 5.3 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, which is the concentration of the hydroxide ion. The POH will be 5.78 taking the negative log of the concentration of hydroxide. And pH plus COH adds up to 14, so that means my pH is 8.22 at the equivalence point. Which makes sense because I have a basic salt, and when you have a basic salt, you are not at a pH of 7. You are above a pH of 7 because bases are more than 7 in their pH. And if I look at the graph, it's actually saying that the equivalence point was about here. Actually, it looks it looks like our number's better than their number anyway, because I thought that was a little bit high on the slope. It's approximately nine, but it's actually eight point two two. There's one other common calculation that they do, really common calculation that they do with strong acids with weak bases and weak bases with strong acids. They love to figure out what the halfway point of the equation is. So we're going to calculate that. Um, here, the pH is equal to the pKa of the weak acid. The halfway point is simply when the concentration of the acid is equal to the concentration of its conjugate base. We're going to give it a try uh, doing the stoichiometry and then using the henderson hasselbalch equation at the halfway point. I'll show you what's going on with this. So the halfway point on the graph, if the equivalence point is at 50 milliliters of the acid, then the halfway point is 125 milliliters reacting. Maybe that's about right. I want to figure out what the pH is there. Remembering that they can ask you to figure out the pH at any point in the graph, but these are some of the common ones. The beginning, the equivalence point, the halfway point, those are the big three. First thing I'm going to do is the equilibrium, uh, not the equilibrium, the stoichiometry. And I'm just going to do that on the left hand side here. So this whole left hand of that line is going to be stoic. Same reaction, we're just C2H3O2. It's a net ionic equation right away. And let's just get rid of the sodium. It's a spectator ion. 2H3O2. Sodium acetate. I'm just getting rid of the sodium again. Plus water. College board doesn't like spectator ions in there, so let's just get rid of them. Yeah. We're starting out with the acid, and we know the volume of the acid that's in the Erlenmeyer flask. It's uh, the 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar. So we have 0 0.0050 moles again, for the same reason it was that number up above in the previous two parts. When we get it to the halfway point, we're going to use 25 milliliters of the 0.100 molar base, and that will give us 0 0.0 moles of the base. Regardless, if I want to be at the halfway point, I want to have half as many moles of my titrant as I do my acid in this case. And we start out with nothing here. But this time it's a little different because we're not going to completely consume 
the acid. We're not going for the equivalence point. We're going for the halfway point. So we're going to consume all of the hydroxide, which will only consume half the acid. It will go down by 0 0.0025 mole. 0 0.0025 that becomes 0 0.0025 mole, 0 mole, and 0 0.0025 mole. This also creates a new volume. I'm just going to write it down here and then I'll rewrite it up there. But your volume, in order to get those moles, it was 50 milliliters of the acid plus only 25 milliliters of the base, so 75 milliliters. So I'm going to come up here, divide by 0 0.075 liters. And my molarity. 0 0.033 molar, 0 molar, and 0 0.033 molar. Still not done. But now we can switch over to Henderson Hasselbach, which makes it go pretty quick. This would be like one free response question. But this is a three part question though too. I mean, you got, you got the initial, you got the equivalence point and you got the halfway point. That's like three different questions. Usually you're not asked to do all three of them in one problem. Because if you screw up, if you screw up one of them, like the beginning, then you screw up like everything and it's just be like a complete mess. So. I remember seeing the Grinch. My heart is two sizes too small. pH is going to be the negative log. 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Just let me make that neater. Of one point eight times ten to the negative fifth plus point zero three three divided by point zero three three. This time we can use the Henderson Hasselbach because we have some information about this and some information about this. We have that common ion thing going on in the equation. You couldn't use that up above because you didn't have both pieces, but now because we have the acid and its conjugate base, we can use this. Essentially, we have a buffer solution going on here. Um, simplify that one step. This would be, well, the pH is equal to pKa. 0.033 over 0 .0, 0 0.033 is 1. The log of 1 is 0. So this part is 0. Then pH is equal to the negative log of the Ka value, which is the halfway point. pH is equal to pKa, which is really important to see because it will help you a lot with uh, multiple choice questions on the test. And the pH will be 4.74 at the halfway point, which if we looked at the graph, would be about right here. And apparently that's 4.74. So Henderson Hasselbach can really help you out with uh, the halfway point of the titration. One of the things that you'll also see about this 
And this is a common thing to bring up. When you uh, are titrating the weak against a strong, whether it's acid or a base uh, for the weak, you create a buffer solution because you have the uh, acid and its conjugate base both in solution with that common ion. In this case, at the halfway point, we actually have a perfectly balanced buffer solution. And it just happens to be at that halfway point, the pH equals the pKa as well. So it's quick to calculate. You can do some of that stuff just with multiple choice without a calculator. Some of that stuff. So don't forget this statement here. pH is equal to the pKa of the weak acid because the concentration of the acid is equal to the concentration of its conjugate base. Is it always true? At the halfway point, whenever you have a weak with a strong, that's always true. If it was, um, if it was for a base, like a weak base with a, a strong acid, then I guess you could say that the pOH is equal to the pKb at the halfway point, which is the counter equal. So, on the test, if we have, so if we have a problem like this, we have to give them the Ka, then we can find the pKa, then we can go through all those steps, or can we just use the pKa? Um, good question. For this part, because you know it's a weak acid with a strong base and you're told to calculate the pH at the halfway point, the smart thing to do would just uh, go right to that and finish up the problem without doing all the equilibrium stuff in between. And that's why it's really good to know that because you could do you could do that in a multiple choice format or something like that without having to do any work basically. Yep, the negative log of the Ka value, which in this case was the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. But this just showed the work to make it more obvious why. Um, no, um, I don't. I don't think I restrict you from using it ever. But just keep in mind the henderson hasebach doesn't work in every scenario. For example, it wouldn't work in this particular scenario because you have one of the components, but you don't have the starting point of the other one. It's, it's more when it's set like a buffer, and that happens to be true if you're somewhere. Um, if you're somewhere. Between the, between the starting point and the uh, equivalence point, then you'll have parts of both in there. But you wouldn't use it at the starting point, and you wouldn't use it at the equivalence point, but you could use it anywhere in between. And likewise, you would have some opportunity to use it after the equivalence point as well. Good question. This problem is going to be shorter. Um, it's not going to take up a whole page like that one did. Um, this has given us another point along the titration curve that's not the halfway point, but it's not a particularly big deal. But you can't just use uh, pH equals pKa either. So let's just take a look at it. Um, We've got titration, again, with acetic acid and sodium hydroxide. We've got the Ka. This time, we've got 35 milliliters of a base added to 50 milliliters of the weak acid. We've got the same molarity of the acid in the base. We've got 50 milliliters with 35 milliliters. So the first part is the stoichiometry. The second part is the equilibrium. Stoichiometry will have H C two H 
just out of leaving the sodium in there just because I felt like it. Because really with the stoichiometry, you can, you can do it with the spectators in there or without, it doesn't really affect anything. Um, we've got 0.1 molar and we've got 50 milliliters of that. So that's 0 0.05, 100 molar. So again, we're going to have a 0 0.0050 moles. With the sodium hydroxide, though, we're going to have 35 milliliters. And it's also 0.1. That's why I don't like showing that step. It just never fits right. And then uh, we got zero moles of this stuff over here. Things got stretched out a little bit much. When the sodium hydroxide reacts with the acid in this case, this is going to go down what's present but the base is limiting reactant, so it gets completely consumed. And this will be five. Um, now I switch my whole color coding scheme. Uh, we got a new volume. mil and 35 mil. Zero meters. I didn't do the subtraction yet. Sorry. See, that's what happens when I start uh, switching color to screw myself up. All right, let me do a subtraction. Point zero. Zero mole. Five mole. Point zero eight five liters. Give me a molarity of zero one seven six molar, zero molar. It's just sticky. which now I can bring down to the equilibrium part, but this time I have the acetic acid and I've got the acetate ion on both sides of the equation. So I can do the henderson hasselbach for this. Any time between the starting point and the equivalence point, henderson hasselbach works out nicely. pH is gonna be the negative log of which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth, plus the log of the acid, no, sorry, the acid, which is 0 0.04121176. Always double check the base or the acid or the acid or the base because that's the sticky part. Easy to screw up the equation. pH 
just this part is 4.74. Put this log of that over that, that's 0 0.69. Combine those together to get the total pH of 5.11. So that was not equilibrium. That was equilibrium. We just used Henners and Hasselbach to do it instead of doing, you could do the Ka equals the X, uh, the, well, you could do the Ka thing and then plug in the values that you need for your Xs and such, but um, this is faster. We like to use Henners and Hasselbach when we can. Right, because in those situations, um, you don't have both the acid and the conjugate base present before you don't have any of the conjugate base because you haven't made the salt. At equilibrium, the base has completely consumed the acid, so you don't have both of those there. You just have the salt. So it doesn't work to have, you can't have zero in one of these. But anywhere in between, or just after the equivalence point, you can use that because you can do the proportions then. Um, the equivalence point for titrations with weak acids and strong acids, we talked about this a little bit on the previous pages, but I just want to point this out before we look at the last thing. Um, strong acid, you get a very distinct vertical por portion to the line, and you just kind of try to say, okay, that before it curves, curving there, this is the straight part, and I'm going to pick the middle and figure out what pH that is. That's how you interpret that. But when you have a weak acid with a strong base, first off, this usually doesn't look as vertical, and uh, it's also a shorter segment. Let's see, that even looks like it's curved. I'd probably bring it down a little bit. Looks like it's still kind of straight there, maybe. And then we take the middle point of that and we get a much higher pH when you have the weak acid with the strong base because, of course, you're making a basic salt for your equivalence point. This just shows you that the more difference there is, um, we got a strong base down here. This is a strong acid, so we get a very steep vertical line. This is a, still a pretty strong acid. This might be something like uh, hydrofluoric acid. I mean, it's not strong, but it's still pretty strong for a weak acid. You still get a fairly good steep line. But as you get into these really, really weak acids against a strong base, like here, I don't even know what I would do with this line. Like, I don't even see a place where I can figure out where the equivalence point is. Um, but, you know, it gets pretty hard to say, okay, somewhere between where it would be. Ish. So they can be difficult to read, but then again, you can always do the calculations if you have the information needed. The last example is one of those longer ones again. And we might not do the whole thing, but we can at least do the top half of the page. It's kind of always the case that tend to focus a little bit more on what's going on with the acid stuff and, you know, like KAs and stuff like that. And then we always kind of treat the bases a little bit like an afterthought. Um, but it's definitely important that we do one on the basic side. A weak base titrated against a strong acid. In this case, the weak base will be ammonia and the strong acid will be hydrochloric acid. And they are not the same molarity this time. so can't be quite as uh, easy with the calculation of the numbers. And we're going to be starting out with the base and adding an acid to it. So we're going to start out high and end lower. The equivalence point will be the center of that somewhat vertical portion of the graph. And it's going to be a pH less than 7. Since now, when we put a strong acid with a weak base, we're going to get an acidic salt as our endpoint at the equivalence point. And uh, the acidic salt, of course, has a pH less than 7 because it's an acidic salt. 
So let's take some information. <clears throat> So we're going to have NH the uh, molecular form, NH3 with a Cl. Make some NH4 and chlorine ions. Strong acid and it completely ionizes. The, the hydrogen and the chlorine of the hydrochloric acid should be separated from each other. So a proper net ionic equation for that one would be the ammonia reacting with the hydrogen ion to make ammonium get rid of the chlorine altogether. That's just a little cleaner. And of course, the College Board likes a net ionic equation whenever possible. The geometry of this first. And uh, we're actually going to do the equilibrium part to the right of that line. So I kind of spaced it that way because below this, there's a separate problem. Um, I've got different molarities for the hydrochloric acid and the ammonia. So I'm just going to quick show the numbers for that. We've got 0.100 liters of the base, 100 milliliters, I should say. 0 0.50 that. So that's going to be a familiar 0 0.005 moles of the ammonia. And then we have a different molarity for the base. We're using a 0 0.010 liter, a 10 milliliter solution of that, which is 0 0.1 moles per liter molarity. And that's going to give us a very small 0 0.001 of the hydrogen or the HCl. So I just put it up there because I don't want to clutter up my stoichiometry like I did last time. 0 0.0050 0 .0 moles to begin with and 0 0.0010 moles of that to begin with. None of this. So this is not at the equivalence point. This is somewhere in between um, because we're just adding some acid to the base, but the acid is going to get completely used up and it's not going to use up all the base. This will go down by a little bit. Well, this will go down and this will go up by point zero. <clears throat> so that will give us do you have a new volume got some room in here we got plenty of room on this part new volume all right down here 100 mil plus 10 mil, 10 mil, which we will put in down here. And then we can calculate what the molarity is going to be for each of those to bring down to our equilibrium. This will be 0 0.03, 0 molar, and 0 0.0091 molar. Get the stoic out of the way. Over to the right of that line, I'm going to use a little Henderson Hasselbach to finish this off. And Henderson Hasselbach will work this time because I've got the weak base and I've got its conjugate acid. I've got them both present. So I can use that uh, 
that ratio from like Henderson Hasselbach. Now there's actually over here two possible ways we could set this up. Be able to set it up and solve it for one. But this is the Henderson Hasselbach, I'm going to show you both. Maybe you can see which one fits your brain better. Because this is written as a base, ammonia is a receiver of hydrogen. Um, you could do your Henderson Hasselbach with a pOH instead of a pH, a, a pKV. And if you do that, it would be plus the log of the concentration of your acid over your base. That's the base version of the Henderson Hasselbach versus the acid pH version of the Henderson Hasselbach. So if I put some numbers in there, the pOH of this would be the negative log of the pKb of ammonia, which is 1.8 times 10 acetic acid has the same numbers, plus the log of the acid portion over the base portion, and the acid portion would be the what is it, tiny 0, 0, 0.09 over 0 0.036. We get a pH of that, a pOH, 4.15, then 9.85. That'd be good enough if you wanted to go that route. But because we got a weak base and it's conjugate acid and they're in equilibrium with each other, it would still work if you thought of it being this way. What if you thought, here, I'll say we'll turn it. You could say this. would react if you wrote it in that direction you would have a Ka value here because you know it's losing its hydrogen it's giving a hydrogen and if you did it that way then you could use the pH version of the Henderson Hasselbach and it would be the negative one uh, 5.56 or 5.6, we'll say 5.56, that's what I have here, times 10 to the negative 10, plus the log, and now you just have to be careful because you put the base over the acid for this equation, it'd be 0 0.0091, and your pH would come up with eight, surprise, surprise, 9.85 that way. So you actually get two different routes you can take to get to that. At the bottom of the page is definitely worth doing. Um, the pH at the equivalent point when you got a weak base involved with strong acid. I didn't think I was going to get to it. I knew I wasn't going to get to it. So I made you a copy of my notes for that one. Back to the whole last week here. This is what I usually write like or not on the board. Fairly neat. Um, and of course, there's a chunk of problems that you can now tackle the whole work. 
one more section tomorrow. And that was really one of the last really needed sections, I think, here. Well, yeah. Okay. And that's it. Thank you.